All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So for announcements, uh, you have Lab 7 pre-lab due this week, and also Lab 7 will keep on uh, an eye on the weather, see what the snow does tomorrow, and keep an eye on the university's announcements about what happens with, with the snow and any impacts. But let's just plan on continue uh, going forward with that. For homework six, it, the homework six is originally due, was originally due on Monday. I'm going to change that to Tuesday so that you have time on Monday during office hours to ask questions about transistors. We'll be finishing up the transistors topics today. So, so you can ask questions today or on Monday about homework six, because that will be due Tuesday, just delaying at 24 hours there. We will have an exam next week on Wednesday, the 20th, March 20th. And that will be during class plus the 30 minute uh, grace period for the regular time. Uh, the topics covered will be capacitors and inductors through transistors. So you will have worked homework topics all the way through uh, through those topics. And I will be sending out an announcement on Canvas with more details. So look for that coming up. If you have any questions uh, during class, please ask them uh, via chat or unmute. And if you have any questions you'd like to discuss after class, stop by office hours right after class on this Zoom session. OK, so last time we started to talk about transistors. And, and I showed you a schematic symbol of the transistor. And I named the terminals collector, base, and emitter. And I talked about the important currents, the base current and the collector current the two important voltages that we're going to work with, the base to emitter voltage and the collector to emitter voltage. And I started this animation. I said, well, here's a fluid flow analogy of a transistor. So imagine you have a tank of water and you have a pipe and the water flows down through the, through the pipe if you orient it this way. And then we're going to put a valve in. And what we'd like to do is be able to control that valve so that we can uh, control water through that big pipe coming out of the tank. So here I've gotten rid of the tank, but there's the big pipe with fluid being controlled by the valve. And really what we'd like to do is um, control that big amount of current with a small amount of current to make the fluid flow analogy of a transistor. So I'm going to install another pipe here. This pipe is much smaller, maybe 100 times in diameter smaller. And I'm going to install what I call a flapper. And that flapper is, is hinged at this point on the upper right. And you could push it open. So you could, if you could put your finger in that pipe, you could push that flapper all the way open. And you could release it. And it would be spring actuated closed, right? So, so if you let go of it, it closes. And if you push on it, it opens up, right? Use your imagination here with this. Um, and so you could push this flapper open with fluid through that small pipe. If I pump a little bit of fluid, uh, I could get that flapper to open just a little bit. If I start pumping more fluid, I could get that flapper to open even more. I could put so much fluid that the flapper is all the way open, right? And then I could reduce the flow and control that flapper with fluid. So imagine I connect some kind of linkage between the flapper and the valve. <clears throat> okay, so if I push that flapper just a little bit, then the valve opens a little bit. If I push that flapper a little bit more, the valve opens a little bit more, right? So just like that, if I push the flapper all the way open, the valve's all the way open. So in this way, I could use that flapper to control the valve position, right? OK, so let's, let's put the, the fluid back in, in the system here. And so, so what I could do is this. If I have no fluid flowing through that small pipe, then there's no fluid flowing through the big pipe because the valve is closed, the flapper is closed. But if I push that flapper open just a little bit with fluid, I get a little bit of fluid or, you know, uh, I get some fluid flowing through the big pipe. Push the flapper open even more with more of this current, more of this fluid flowing through the little pipe, and more flows through the big pipe until you know finally I can push that flapper all the way open with the small pipe fluid, 
and that valve is all the way open for the big pipe. Okay, so this is again analogous of how a transistor is going to work. Um, but you, you, you know, you can kind of see that there. I can I can control different amounts of fluid flow in the big pipe using just a little bit of current, just a little bit of fluid flow with the small pipe. Okay, so let's talk about um, regions of operation here with this fluid flow analogy. They're going to map map directly to the um, transistor circuit. So here are the regions of operation. So one region is called uh, um, cutoff, right? Cutoff is when there's no fluid flowing through the small pipe. So there's no fluid flowing through the big pipe, right? And I'm using gallons per minute here as a rate of flow. So zero gallons per minute, through the small pipe means zero gallons per minute through the big pipe. Okay, that's called cutoff. Now, uh, if I start flowing fluid through the small pipe, I get into the linear region of operation. So the small pipe flow linearly controls big pipe flow. And, and let's say, let's just use a rough number here. Let's say the big pipe flow is 100 times the small pipe flow. So if I have one gallon per minute through the small pipe, I get 100 gallons per minute through the big pipe, right? So I can I can vary the small pipe fluid flow, and that lets me control proportionally larger, but proportionally the big pipe flow. Okay, so I can just vary the big pipe flow using that small pipe flow. If I push that valve all the way open by using so much small pipe flow, um, then we reach what's called saturation. This is the saturation region. So let's suppose with three gallons per minute through the small pipe, I've opened up that flapper all the way, I've opened up the valve all the way. That's as much fluid as can flow through that big pipe. The valve is all the way open. Um, so the flapper and the valve are fully open. More small pipe current will not cause any more big pipe current flow. So I could even increase the small pipe current. I can put a little more, right? Here's uh, four gallons per minute. And that that pink valve there, it's all the way open. So you're not going to get any more big pipe flow. So I've lost linearity. I'm in saturation. Okay, so, so this um, relates pretty well to how a transistor operates analogously. Okay, so here's the transistor. I've drawn here an NPN bipolar junction transistor. We'll just call that an NPN BJT. Here are the terminals that I described earlier. Okay. And uh, so let's draw the, write those terminals on the fluid flow analogy diagram, right? This would be the collector up, up the top that's where the big fluid flows in, the big current flows in. The base, right, that's where the small pipe is, and the emitter, that's where the, uh, the two flows come out the bottom. Okay, so on the transistor diagram, I have collector current and I have base current. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to use base current to, call, uh, to control collector current. So analogously, the big pipe flow is the collector flow. The small pipe flow is the base flow. Okay, we're going to use the base flow to control, or we, in this analogy, we used base flow to control collector flow. Okay, in the transistor, we're going to use base current, electrical current, to control collector current. Okay, so here, if I put some numbers on this, you know, imagine I have zero fluid flow on the left into the base, then I'll get zero collector flow. Well, that's just like the transistor. If I have zero current going through into the base, then I will have zero collector current flow, okay? Now there's something external to the transistor here that is trying to cause current to flow from the collector terminal to the emitter terminal, right? So this is connected to a voltage source and maybe a resistor or an LED something, but there's some, the current is trying to flow from collector to emitter into the collector, out of the emitter. Um, but this transistor is preventing that flow. Well, except when you apply base current, then you can control that flow. 
Okay, so if I um, if I have a little bit of base current, I apply a little bit of base current, then I'm going to get collector current. And in this case, um, I have I'm relating collector current to base current using this equation on the right. I C the collector current is beta times I B. Beta is the current gain of this transistor. Okay, let's use a rough number of 100. That's practical for many small signal transistors. Um, so collector current will be 100 times base current when the transistor is operating linearly. Okay, so if I increase this base current just a little bit, I'll get more collector current. Right, this is following that fluid flow analogy with the valve opening and closing on the left, but this is we're doing this electrically on the right. Okay, so so I can linear, I can cut off the current, and then I can linearly control the current that's entering the collector using the base current. Once I reach a certain level of base current, then I've reached saturation. Analogously, that's like the valve on the left is all the way open. Okay. Um, on the right in the transistor, I've reached a current for a particular circuit where if, if I increase the base current, right, point, I vary maybe between 0.3 and 0.4, well, at 0.3, I've reached saturation. And if I increase that base current, I can't get any more collector current. The transistor saturated, okay? And so, so when you think of the transistor operating using electrical current, you can kind of go back to the fluid flow analogy and, and relate the concepts. Okay, in saturation, what happens, and, and um, there's transistor curves that describe this, we're gonna use an approximation, but in saturation, silicon transistors, many of them um, have a collector to emitter voltage of about 0.2 volts, might be 0.1 volts, 0.2 something volts, maybe around there, but we're gonna use an approximation of 0.2 volts. It works pretty well. Okay, so that's how we're going to identify when a transistor is in saturation. We're going to look at VCE. So knowing nothing else about this transistor, you see some currents flowing into the base, into the collector. The way we're going to identify saturation is VCE falls to 0.2 volts. And we're gonna say it cannot go below 0.2 volts. Okay. And that's again, an approximation. Okay, so that is what we're going to use a transistor for in this class. We're going to use base current to control collector current, and we're going to look at um, a couple examples of that. So what, what can you do with this? You can use um, the transistor in an amplifier, right? I can linearly vary a little bit of current uh, to control a lot of current. That's, that's an amplifier or you can switch between cutoff, right? Cutoff is like an off switch or an open switch and saturation and saturation is like um, a closed switch. And we'll do an example of that. So you can use a transistor be, to be an amplifier and to be an electronically controlled switch. So you can control current to a motor or to some other electrical device. Okay. All right. So let's look at some views of the bipolar junction transistor to BJT. I showed you this one. This is the schematic symbol. Um, it, if I were to draw a cartoon of the semiconductor material, it would look like this. So this is why the transistor, this particular transistor is called an NPN transistor because it has an N region, a P region, and an N region, right? That Those junctions between N and P look a lot like the diode junctions that we talked about. Okay. So collector current, which is normally trying to flow down to the emitter, it can't because it's encountering this reverse biased NP region here. But you can flow current from base to emitter, right? This is a PN junction here. So um, it, this looks like a diode between the PN and the N region. So you can, uh, you can cause current to flow from base to emitter. Now this is a cartoon because it's not exact, the geometry is not exactly like this. I'll show you what it is like, but the, the base current um, induces or causes charges to flow through the, from the P to the N region from base to emitter. And those charges actually influ influence the, the, 
the NP region from collector to base and allow current to flow proportionally um, when the trans transistor is not in saturation. Okay. But you could view a transistor just if you were to take a diode tester and test a transistor, you would see this. You would see it looks like a couple diodes. Now, you cannot take a couple diodes and put them together like this and create a transistor because, again, you have to have some, you have to have this on one device so that the base to emitter current can influence that collector to base junction. More realistically, the transistor looks like this. Okay, so here's a cartoon, like a cross section of a transistor. And here's a, here's a transistor on the bottom here on a, looks like a, a die on a substrate here. Okay. Okay, so there's, um, some views of a transistor. Let's talk about, before we work an example, um, kind of a summary slide of, of the, the transistor and its regions of operation. So here's the transistor with its terminals identified. The important currents that we're going to deal with are base current and collector current. Base current and collector current all but they both flow out of the emitter, right? So collector flows out of the emitter, base flows out of the emitter. That's where the current is going. The important voltages are VBE. VBE looks like a diode um, voltage. So the, the base to emitter is a PN junction. And so uh, IB versus B, let me say that again, IB versus VBE, if you were to plot that, looks like a silicon diode if this is a silicon transistor. Okay, so we're going to say that whenever we have a silicon transistor, VBE, when current is flowing into the base, VBE is going to be 0.7 volts, right? just like when current flows through a transistor. That's essentially the forward voltage of the transistor formed by base to emitter junction. Okay. Um, so the regions of operation are these. When you're in cutoff, when the transistor's in cutoff, we have no base current and no collector current. When the transistor's operating linearly, then IC is equal to beta IB. Now you could say, wait a minute, that's, you know, if I make IB zero and IC zero, so that's cutoff. So cutoff is linear. Yeah, but cutoff is a special case of a linear operation. So, but um, when we're operating linearly, the collector current is some number right, that's in the transistor data sheet. There's a range, um, some number times IB. That's the proportional control there. And if the transistor is operating linearly, uh, then we're going to say VCE must be greater than 0.2 volts. And if VCE falls to 0.2 volts or tries to go below, then we're going to say the transistor is in saturation. So when VCE is approximately 0.2 volts, and really on the transistor curves, you'll see 0.1 to 0 0.3. But, but when we see VCE at 0.2 volts, the transistor is in saturation. Okay. And in that case, if you were to if you were to look at the, the beta that you used for linear operation, IC is less than beta linear IB. Okay, because you can increase IB, but IC stays about the same. Right? So IB can go up in saturation, but IC won't go up because the transistor is saturated. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is put this all together into an example and um, show you these different regions of operation and how, how, they, um, how they look in a circuit. All right, so let's move over to the whiteboard. Okay, let's do a transistor example. So this circuit is going to look like this. I'm going to have a transistor here. Okay. This is an NPN transistor because the arrow points out. If you have an arrow pointing in, 
That's a PNP transistor. We're going to primarily work with, except for maybe one example during motors, we're going to primarily work with NPN transistors that look like this. Okay, so let's do this. Let's say I have um, a resistor at the collector. Let's make that a little neater. And I have a grounded emitter. And somehow, uh, you know, maybe I have a current source or a voltage source with a resistor on the left. We'll work on that. But I have, um, I'm causing current to happen into the base. So I'm going to control IB with some external circuit. Let's call this resistor RC since it's connected to the collector. Let's say it's 100 ohms. Okay. And let's call this uh, transistor Q1. Q is the designator for a transistor, usually. Let's say you look at the data sheet for this transistor and you see beta equals 100 for the conditions under which you're operating. And um, and let's say that uh, when the transistor saturated, the collector to emitter voltage is approximately 0 0.2 volts. So VCE sat, VCE and saturation is 0 0.2 volts. And let's say this is a silicon transistor. So that means uh, VBE, well, we don't need that right now, but VBE is equal to 0 0.7 volts when IB is positive, greater than zero. OK. So what I want to show you with this example is, OK, how, how IB controls IC um, and how you know when this transistor is in saturation and what that looks like. So. We're going to identify saturation by looking at VCE. And I'm going to say that we have a node voltage. We have a power supply connected uh, to this top node here, and it's giving us 5 volts. So we have a 5 volt power supply connected there. Okay. And so we're going to vary IB and see what happens to IC and see what happens to VCE. Yeah. Let's make a table that, that shows this. So let's make a table of uh, IB. We, we are going to be causing IB to flow and vary. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out IC. And what we're going to do is assume linearity. We're going to assume that the transistor is operating linear, linearly and, and then check VCE to make sure VCE didn't fall below 0.2 volts. Okay. If, if VCE tries to fall below 0.2 volts, then we know that the transistor is in saturation. We'll have to do something else. Okay, in order to check VCE and see what that value is, I'm going to have to calculate this, this value here. We'll call that VX. Okay. And VX by Ohm's law, we have current flowing down through RC. We're gonna call VX, or we would calculate it as IC times RC. Okay, so I'm going to make a table here. So VX is ICRC. And then once we know VX, we could figure out what VCE is because we want we want to check VCE to see if this transistor is in saturation. So how do we calculate VCE given VX? We can write a KVL equation. Okay. Um, 
here's how I'm going to write that KVL equation. Whenever you have just a node voltage uh, that is a power supply voltage like this, you could always explicitly draw in, write in that, that power supply voltage as a source. So plus minus five volts. That's not VCE. I don't want to write that right there, five volts. So when I have a node voltage and a ground drawn, and that's a power supply voltage, I could I could actually maybe to make a KVL visually easier, uh, insert the power supply, insert a voltage source as that power supply. Okay. And I can write a KVL equation now to figure out what is VCE um, in the circuit. Okay. So the way I do this is just start at any point in a loop that has, you know, VCE in it and other voltages would be known. So if I start here and I say minus five plus VX plus VCE equals zero, there's my KVL. So minus five. I'm down across v, uh, RC, that's plus VX plus VCE equals zero. VCE equals five minus VX. Oh. Vx, wait a minute. I do that right. Vce, yeah, five minus vx, like that. So I'll write that here. Okay. All right. So let's start out by putting no current into the base. And here's the process. We're going to decide on what base current we want to flow into the base. We're going to assume linearity, calculate IC. And then we're going to check if the transistor is operating linearly by first calculating VX and then calculating VCE. If VCE is greater than 0.2 volts, the transistor is operating linearly. And uh, the IC value that we calculated is correct. If VCE tries to fall below 0.2 volts, then we have to do something different, and I'll and I'll show you what that is. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's start out with IB equals uh, zero milliamps. So that's my IB value. If I have zero milliamps flowing um, into the base, then using IC as beta IB, or just knowing that that's cut off, I have zero milliamps flowing into the collector. That means VX is zero milliamps times 1000 or 100 in this case, this is 100. So zero times 100, which is zero volts. VCE is five minus zero, just five. All right. Okay. Let's increase the base current just a little bit. Let's say we're going to apply 0 0.1 milliamps to the base. Okay. Let's assume linearity. And so when you have a transistor operating linearly, IC equals beta IB. Right? That's only if the transistor is operating linearly. Okay, so let's see. Oh, and I gave you a beta, 100. So 100 times 0.1 is 10 milliamps. Okay, so if the transistor is operating linearly, IC is 10 milliamps, we have to check that. We have to check VCE. Okay, so let's calculate VX first. 10 milliamps times 100 ohms is 1 volt. Now we have to check VCE or calculate VCE, which is five minus VX, that's four volts. Okay, four volts is above 0.2 volts. So yes, we're operating linearly with, with 0.1 milliamps into the base. Let's keep increasing this current, 0.2 milliamps into the base. Let's assume linearity. 0.2 times 100 is 20 milliamps. 
if I have 20 milliamps flowing into the collector, then Vx is 20 milliamps times 100, that's two volts. If I have two volts across RC, then VCE is five minus two, it's three volts. Okay, so you can kind of see where this is going. VCE is falling and eventually it's going to hit 0.2 volts. All right, let's increase the current a little more, 0.4 milliamps. Let me get rid of that five volts there. So I'm gonna confuse us. Okay, so I have 0.4 milliamps. If the transistor is operating linearly, 0.4 times 100 is 40 milliamps. But we have to check linearity. We have to check that this transistor is actually operating linearly to use that. So let's check it. Okay, if I have 40 milliamps flowing down through RC, then Vx is 40 milliamps times 100. That's 4 volts. If I have 4 volts across the collector resistor here, then VCE is 5 minus 4. That's 1 volt. Okay. Let's increase this base current to a strategically or tactically chosen current, 0.48 milliamps. If the transistor is operating linearly, IC will be beta IB, which is 0.48 times 100, that's 48 milliamps. Uh, if I have 48 milliamps flowing, then um, the voltage across RC is 100 times 48 milliamps, that's 4.8 volts. If I have 4.8 volts across this resistor, then VCE from collector to emitter is 0 0.2 volts. Okay, so I am right on the edge of saturation here. Right, I'm kind of on the border of linearity and, and saturation. Okay, but we can increase the current. We, it, we're not going to hurt the transistor putting it into saturation. In fact, often we do that um, intentionally. Let's put uh, 0 0.5 milliamps into the base. If the transistor is operating linearly, we're going to find it's not, but if it is, we, we would say, okay, IC is beta IB, so we have IC is 0 0.5 times 150 milliamps. If we have 50 milliamps flowing into the collector, VX is 5 volts. Okay. Uh, if we have 5 volts uh, for VX, then VCE has fallen to 0 volts. Now, we know the transistor has fallen into saturation because you cannot have this. You can't have a VCE fall to zero volts. Okay, there's going to be some voltage here. We're calling it 0.2 in saturation. Okay, so this is, this is not going to happen. This is wrong, right? This is not going to happen. This is going to be 0.2 volts because that's as low as it can fall, fall approximately. And, and then we work backwards. We say, okay, this transistor is in saturation. VCE is 0.2 volts. So if VCE is 0.2 volts, then what is VX? Because that's determined by the KVL equation. So if VCE is 0.2 volts. VX must be 4.8 volts, right? And by Ohm's law, if we have VX equal to 4.8 volts and RC is 100 ohms, then IC is 48 milliamps, okay? So we've put the transistor into saturation. The most current that can flow in the circuit into the collector is 48 milliamps, okay? And you can increase the current. Let's put this transistor deep into saturation. Let's put five milliamps um, into the base. So at five milliamps, Let's write it down here a little bit. With five milliamps into the base, if the transistor were operating linearly, we'd have 500 milliamps uh, flowing into the collector. If we had 500 milliamps flowing, uh, then we would have 50 volts. 
right? 0.5 amps times 100 ohms, 50 volts Vx. And then we would have VCE 5 minus 50 minus 45 volts. We know that can't happen. VCE cannot go below 0.2 volts approximately. So you say, no, that can't happen. We're going to have 0.2 volts. That's the lowest VCE can go. So VX must be for the same reason as the line before, 4.8 volts. Okay, if you have 4.8 volts across a 100 ohm resistor, you have 48 milliamps. Okay, so, um, so what we've seen here, we've seen that here's cutoff. So this is cutoff here. Right. And then we have this linear region, this linear variation in current where I linearly control IC using IB. So IC is proportional to IB. And then we have saturation. And so right, right, at, right at VCE equal to 0.2 volts, we're right on the edge of linear and saturation. So you could probably call it either, but, but we're definitely operating linearly here. We're definitely in saturation down here. So um, those are the three re regions in this example. Okay, well, uh, this is kind of neat because look what we've created. We've, we've created a circuit um, that can vary one current using another current. What's that sound like from the beginning of class when we talked about sources? That's a current controlled current source, right? So we're controlling IC, we're causing IC to flow by changing IB, right? In, the contr in a current controlled current source, you were using one current to control another current, right? We also have a current controlled voltage source. Here's a voltage that varies with current, right? So you're changing, th this voltage depends on IB. So we have a current controlled voltage source. Here's another volt voltage source, right? Here's another voltage that's controlled by a current. So this is also a, um, this voltage here is, is a, can be represented as a, a current controlled voltage source. And then if I put something out here that where I have a variable voltage and maybe a resistor, so I vary the voltage and that varies the current into the base, right? Now I can have a voltage change these values. So I can have a voltage controlled current source and a voltage controlled voltage source, all with this one circuit, right? If I add a voltage source and a resistor over here. So here's a practical example of those sources that we talked about, the controlled or dependent sources that we talked about in the beginning of class. Um, someone she, uh, says in the chat, can we always assume linearity or what cases would be different? So starting off, you can assume linearity, but then you have to check if you're wrong, right? If you assume linearity and you find that VCE has fallen or tries to fall below 0.2 volts, then the transistor saturation is saturated and the linearity assumption is wrong. So, so assume linearity and then figure out if the transistor saturated. Okay, and if, if it is saturated, um, right, IC is less than beta, what I say linear is less than beta linear IB. So this is the beta that you would get for operating linearly. But as you can see here, IC is less than because it's 48 milliamps, it's less than 100 times IB. So that's what saturation shows here. Okay. Um, so when we're operating linearly, uh, we're operating as an amplifier. That's an application of a linearly operated transistor. Right? Because I can take I can take a microphone or an audio output that varies just a little bit of current into this, and then I can cause a lot of current to flow through a speaker, for example. So I have a current amplifier here. And I can also have you know, a, a voltage ampli amplified by another voltage. But when you're operating a transistor linearly, you're causing that transistor to act like an amplifier. When you're operating a transistor in either 
uh, uh, cutoff or saturation, right? When you're when you're varying between cutoff and saturation, um, you, you're varying between zero amps and the maximum current that can flow. Okay, so you're using this transistor as a switch. You're turning the current off or you're turning the current on using a small amount of current. And so that's um, operating as a switch, an electronically controlled switch. Okay, man, my writing's horrible today. Okay, so so when you when you think uh, transistor operating linearly, that's acting like an amplifier. When you're either when you're varying between cutoff and saturation, like let's say you have a microcontroller that can only output a little bit of current um, or cut it off, then you can control a big amount of current using a transistor, and it's acting as an electronically controlled switch. Okay, all right. So let's do that. Let's. Uh, Let's do an example where I'm using a transistor as a switch. I have a question real quick. Yeah, sure. Um, you can keep it racing. Um, okay, yes, yeah, the, the So my question is like, what happens with um, the output current? Like clearly, you know, sum of currents in equals currents out. So if we pump five, amps through this transistor, is it going to get five amps plus 48 milliamps or is it going to get, is it going to burn out? Like what's the, what happens right. when you, when you actually go beyond the saturation? Okay. So it's, it's okay to go into saturation and let's suppose you're using 0.1 milliamps to control 10 milliamps, right? Like that. Cause beta is 100. You're going to have 10.1 milliamps come out of the emitter. Right, that's where the current is going. So that's how KCL is obeyed here. Um, but but what you have is you actually have, uh, you know, if this transistor is saturated, let me get rid of these numbers. But if this transistor is saturated, and let's say you have 0 0.2 volts, and I have one amp flowing, then the power dissipated in this case, you have a little bit of current into the base, but let's suppose that's negligible. It's 100 times less. This transistor is seeing uh, P is equal to I times V, right? One amp times 0 0.2 volts, which is uh, what, 0.2 watts, right? Well, what if I have 10 amps, right? 10 amps, now I'm up to two watts, right? What if I have 100 amps, now I'm up to 20 watts? So that's what happens to a transistor is it gets hot. It's dissipating this power as heat. And you're at, you can actually physically burn up the semiconductor material if it gets too hot or if it doesn't have a sufficient heat sink. Does that answer your question? Um, so my question was more if we're saturating the base, not the collector. Like if that 10 amps goes through the base, where it's is only expecting a small amount. Yeah. Well. Uh, well. So so that you're going to get the same thing. So. Uh, okay. If, if you have 10 amps, if you try to put 10 amps through this, you have 0 0.7 volts here, right? So you're going to have seven watts in that, uh, dissipated by that junction. And, and that so- That might be outside the specs yeah. of the transistor. That's right. And typically okay. you wouldn't do that. There, there would be no reason to do that. That'd be like, you know, something bad happened and um, you wouldn't design it like that. But, but the same principle applies that, uh, I times V for that junction is the power dissipated, and that would cause the transistor to burn out. But just saturating a transistor is not a bad thing. You just have to stay below its power rating. Okay. Yep. Okay. So let's do an example that is... Uh, that shows a transistor being used as a switch.
So let's suppose that you have a transistor that is controlling current through a light emitting diode, an LED. And, and this is practical. If you have an LED that you know, maybe a, takes 20 milliamps or 50 milliamps or something like that, and you, and you want to control it with a microcontroller that can output only, let's say, you know, one or two or five milliamps, then what you can do is you can use a transistor to control current through your load through the LED. Uh, and you can use just a little bit of current to do the controlling. Okay, so let's do this. Let's say um, I have two resistors here, RC and RB. And I have a, a transistor Q1. And Q1 is a silicon transistor that has beta equal to 100. And VCE saturation of 0 0.2 volts, approximately. And you have a diode. This diode D1 here is a light emitting diode. And it has a forward voltage of 1.8 volts. Okay. And I have a five volt power supply powering this node here. And then I have maybe an output of a microcontroller right here. It's a digital output. We'll talk about that, but we have some input voltage from, from some other circuit, right? This that is applied here. And and this is either, let's say it's either zero volts or five volts. Zero volts or Five volts. In other words, when we want the LED to be on, we apply five volts. We want the, when we want the LED to be off, we apply zero volts. But we have very little current flowing, and much more current here through the LED. So let's do this. Let's break this into two parts. This is now now a design problem. So we have the transistor and the LED given, we have to figure out what values do we use for RC and RB so that this works. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to either have this transistor in cutoff, which means the LED is off, or we're going to saturate this transistor, make VCE as small as possible, 0.2 volts, so that the LED turns on and current flows. Okay. Okay, so we're going to find RC, this collector resistor, so that um, the LED current, which is also the collector current, is 25 milliamps. Oops. When Q1 is saturated, Okay. And then we're going to find RB so that we can saturate that transistor with 5 volts applied to VN. Okay, so that's that's the problem we're going to work. Um, and so the approach we're going to take is this. We're going to say, well, when this transistor is saturated, VCE is 0.2 volts. I know what current I want, uh, IC. 
And um, I know the forward voltage here across the diode when current is flowing. So if I know uh, VD, VCE, I can figure out what this voltage is here. This is ICRC, right? So I know VD, which is VF. I know VCE, which is 0.2. Um, I know IC, I want it to be 25 milliamps. I can calculate RC, okay? And then using that, uh, so now I've calculated part A. For part B, what I would do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out, okay, when I apply five volts to VN, um, I could, first I got to figure out how much current, how much base current IB do I need to saturate this transistor. We're going to use the beta value for that. And then once I know IB, I can say this voltage is IBRB. So I know IB, um, I can I could figure out what that voltage is because I know this is five volts. I know this is 0.7 volts here, VBE. And I can figure out RB. Okay, so all these all these voltages and currents are going to be used, but we'll we'll tackle that next time. Okay. All right. So let's end class right here. Once I find my Zoom screen here. Okay, so uh, so don't forget this homework, the next homework um, will be due Tuesday, not Monday. And and I'll get that updated on Canvas tonight. Uh, we have an exam next week. It will cover capacitors and inductors through transistors. And um, I will send an announcement out about that. So uh, if you have any questions about this material or anything else, stop by office hours. I will start those in just a few seconds. So if I uh, if I see you there, let's chat. If not, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.